everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Robert Rowe. I'm the chair of the uh, Department of Music and Performing Arts Professions, and we are thrilled to be uh, hosting this evening. Um, thrilled to be uh, honoring two members of our community, uh, Dr. Prieto and Francisco Nunez. Uh, they are both uh, two of the members of the class of 2011 uh, MacArthur Fellows, uh, which consisted of 22 people all together. So uh, you can imagine our surprise to uh, open the paper and find that 10% of the uh, MacArthur Fellows for one year were coming from uh, the same department. Uh, uh, so we are very thrilled about that, but thrilled that they uh, honor us with their participation in what we do here. Uh, the Department of Music and Performing Arts Professions is a large undertaking. We have uh, 1,600 majors, ranging from undergraduate to doctorate, ranging from uh, jazz to instrumental performance, vocal performance, music technology, music business, but also performing arts administration, drama therapy, and other uh, related fields. Um, I think that what uh, distinguishes us is that even though it's a large undertaking, it's uh, built of a number of small communities, but nonetheless communities that interact with each other in interesting ways. Uh, that's the kind of environment that we try to foster. For example, in jazz performance, undergraduates could choose to take a fifth year and get a, a master's degree in music education and be qualified, be certified to teach. Uh, we also have our jazz majors may take courses in uh, music business or music technology or uh, in other fields in the university. So we really look at a kind of interdisciplinary uh, cross-breeding approach uh, to their education here. Uh, similarly for music ed, uh, they're all, uh, they audition, they're, they're fine musicians, they're taking instrumental lessons while they're here. Um, so they're looking at a broad range of musical issues at the same time that they're learning to become uh, effective teachers. Uh, so that kind of environment, that, that sort of nested communities that are uh, interlocking with each other, uh, we look for people like uh, our two uh, honorees tonight that have, I think, um, are distinguished by the way that they're able to synthesize such a broad range of uh, influences. Um, with my uh, graduate composition seminar this afternoon, we were looking at both of their work and just trying to figure out a way to describe it. I mean, it's really... Uh, uh, unique uh, blends that they have made in their respective fields. The Daphnis Prieto, for example, uh, we were just trying to come up with how you, what style would you say that is? I mean, and uh, finally decided that you couldn't say it was any one style, but it was total mastery of a whole range of styles and then synthesized into a combination that is uniquely his own and then informed by just a rock solid, unbelievable technique. Uh, anything that he wants to do is right there. So the technique is so advanced that you don't even notice it almost. I mean, it's like you're watching the expression rather than the technique, which, uh, which is uh, really remarkable. Uh, Francisco Nunez has been leading the Young People's Chorus of New York City uh, for many years. Uh, both of them are composers as well, so another uh, more evidence of the kind of uh, interdisciplinarity of what they do. Uh, the Young People's Chorus of New York City has been working with uh, young people in New York for uh, for quite a while, but uh, they've done uh, a number of interesting uh, projects, including commissioning top rank composers to write pieces for the group. So people like uh, uh, David Del Tredici or John Corleano or our own faculty member Michael Gordon. Uh, in fact, their festival, Transient Glory, will premiere in about 10 days uh, at Poisson Rouge, also at Carnegie Hall, 92nd Street Y. So it's uh, so quite a, uh, uh, an extravagant uh, and uh, important uh, undertaking. And we're going to get to hear uh, the chorus uh, perform tonight. So each of our recipients will perform a little bit and then be interviewed by uh, John Schaefer from WNYC, who we're also very proud to have with us to help us honor these people. Um, I'll date myself a little bit by saying that I remember a television show called The Millionaire. I don't know if the, uh, the MacArthur people would acknowledge this, but it was a fictional program back in the 60s about, you know, just ordinary people who suddenly one day uh, got a check in the mail for a million dollars and how it changed their lives. Um, so it's kind of an entertaining drama, but uh, the MacArthur Foundation, that's really the way that it works, is that you pick up the phone and uh, suddenly you have $500,000 to spend uh, over the course of five years. Um, I've been involved with the process uh, a number of times, uh, and it really is, you know, it's confidential the whole way along. So a couple of times I've had to write my evaluations of people they were considering or, uh, or suggest names that they might consider further, but in every case it is, we're looking for people of the highest quality who are doing great work, uh, who could uh, benefit from this award and are really doing something that is totally uh, unique and original. Uh, that's what we want and that's what we're looking for and uh, you know, help us do that, but d don't tell them that they've been nominated, don't tell them that you've looked at them, or that you've evaluated, don't say anything about it. So it's a, that's really the way the process works all the way along. So uh, it's really, uh, 
fantastic when you finally read those names in the paper and see uh, that people of such high quality, such caliber have been uh, selected for it and uh, we couldn't be uh, prouder than to have them associated with us. Uh, so they'll be introduced by their, res their directors of their respective uh, programs, Dave Schroeder from Jazz Studies. Uh, Dave is a phenomenal jazz player and has built uh, what I would call the, the best jazz program in the country. Um, has also worked quite a lot in our global programs. He took his ensemble to Shanghai recently where NYU is opening a campus. He can show you on his phone afterwards. He has video of walking out on stage where there's uh, 100,000 people sitting in the hall uh, about to watch uh, their performance. Uh, so Dave will uh, introduce Daphnis and uh, Francisco will be introduced by um, John Gilbert, our uh, Director of Music Education. John was uh, one of my predecessors as chair and it's really his vision in terms of fostering these different programs that interrelate in novel ways that has uh, brought us to where we are today. Uh, but uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Dave Schroeder. Thank you. Um, Dr. Rowe mentioned The Millionaire, if, if, if there's any Millionaire fans. Does the name Jay Beardsford Tipton mean anything to you? No? Okay. Uh, I first became aware of Daphnis Prieto through my students, who one by one approached me saying, oh my god, have you heard this new young Cuban drummer? He's unbelievable. Please hire him immediately. And, I, and uh, so I began testing the waters with Daphnis, first inviting him to uh, a Jude uh, recital, then offered him a master class to see uh, if he was as an inspired teacher as he is an inspired performer. Well, the answer was yes. And uh, over the past six years, Daphnis has continued to raise the standards for instruction within Steinhardt Jazz. Uh, confirming my beliefs that truly inspired artists can also be truly inspired teachers. Um, as his students will attest, Daphnis, while warm and compassionate, is also a meticulous taskmaster, demanding total dedication to the craft of music that he so capably demonstrates. Uh, Daphnis, can you come up here? I want to give you something. Daphnis Grantham. We have uh, an award. Actually, this award you have to give a deposit for. It's like, oh, is it? Yeah. So, uh, Daph says we take great pride in recognizing uh, you, the jazz faculty member and 2011 MacArthur Fellow recipient, for your outstanding contributions to the NYU music community. Daph says Prieto. Thank you. And now we'd like uh, to have a round of applause for Daphnis, who's going to perform a short piece for us. Daphnis Prieto.
Thank you. I'm really glad, very happy to be here today. And uh, I, I really appreciate the support and the recognition, not only from the MacArthur, but from the NYU as well. And uh, especially with the relationship that I have with uh, Dave Schroeder. which actually, uh, thank you, John. Since day one, uh, we really kind of feel connected and I really feel that uh, he was a great guy besides being a great musician and somebody more than capable to do what he's actually building in the jazz community in Sai of NYU. And uh, anyway, there is a lot of things to say. But uh, before I actually uh, finish my act, I would like to share this uh, small thing that I used to do um, when I don't have a, really anything to do, which is most of my time. <laughs> I always say that I laugh at myself because that's not, not true. <laughs> so this is actually a rhythm of the clave, where I come from, from Cuba. So I improvise different rhythms and different things. I can actually obviously speak while I play the clave kind of in an aromatic pilot. just standing here so that you don't see we're moving the drums back. <laughs> but um, you know what? We're going to start our next short segment. I have an interview with uh, Daphnis and the great John Schaefer. How about a round of applause for these guys? And obviously, I'm John. You've already met Daphnis, drummer, composer, band leader, MacArthur Fellow, and show off. Ah, it's part of me. <laughs> what was the, I mean, I actually was going to ask you at some point during our conversation to uh -huh. demonstrate clave, so yes. you've done that. But the first thing that you did, was that, I mean, is that a composed, are, are there signposts? Was it completely off the cuff? What was that? Both. It's all of that. Um, I just like to throw myself up there when I do a solo improvisation. Uh, so it's mainly very improvised, but when you're talking about improvisation, obviously there is different things and different strategies behind it that you kind of are, are aware of it. So, you know, by doing it, I doing it, there is things that you kind of do uh, almost very au automatic, mm -hmm. which you know are going to work. And within that frame, uh, you, you know, you you put yourself up there kind of a, in a naked mode, meaning that you have to act and react. Basically, that's the, what it consists, the improvisation itself is to, to act but react of what you're doing. So basically, it was 100% uh, improvised. I used some uh, motifs like the clave that you could hear actually on the wood block, on the red uh, jam block right there. And, uh, you know, I play different kind of more folkloric uh, rhythms, but a little bit more on my own, with my own taste and my own uh, way of doing it, so. Well, you know, we, especially in, in sort of the Western classical or rock or jazz traditions, we, we tend to think of 
the drums in, in a certain way, you know, mm -hmm. timekeeping, rhythm, paramount. We tend not to think so much of drums as melodic or even harmonic instruments. Yeah. But you were clearly doing <laughs> bits of both during yes, the course. Yes, for me, it has to kind of be, or that's my personal belief, that uh, it has to kind of have a, a balance between the melodic side of the drums and the rhythmic side of the drums. So I try to balance that. And it's something that it has been happening, you know, over the years. Obviously, I've been, you know, trying to develop that as much as possible. And every time that I sit now on the drums, uh, you know, I have more wonderful experience with the melodic side of it and with the rhythmic side of it. And I get, I guess, that's a, a great way to so you, I can complement myself as a as a player and as a soloist and as a composer as well. And which gets to the other thing, which is. The, the drums as an instrument to compose mm -hmm. upon or yes. for. Um, in, at some point in the 90s, I had the great pleasure of presenting Max Roach doing his four-part inventions, mm -hmm. a title that he copped from Bach, of mm -hmm. course. And they were, in fact, compositions, just the way the Bach four-part inventions mm -hmm. were, except instead of being for four different instruments, four different limbs, uh -huh. apart for this hand, apart for this hand, apart for this leg, apart for that. And they were composed pieces. He could reproduce them, mm -hmm. and they were extraordinary. I mean, I know you're, you're aware of those yes, pieces. Yes, I am very aware of those pieces, and, and some other early work that he started actually doing. He was one of the first uh, drummers that started really uh, raising up the quality of the um, compositional elements in within the drums, and doing actually solo performances, which is something that I'm start looking at uh, uh, very soon. Mm -hmm. um, so it's great inspiration and, you know, it's and, no words. And in, in terms of colors, I mean, the, the amount of colors mm -hmm. that you can get out of, I mean, he, he had one invention, which was simply the, the hi-hat. Yes. And it almost, he had it almost sounding like a synthesizer at mm -hmm. one point. It was extraordinary. Um, I, it seems like there is in a drum kit, in the, the full trap set, you have like almost an orchestral amount of colors that you can paint well, with. Well, I mean, if we really, you know, break it apart, this is just an instrument. The music is inside ourselves, and in this case, I feel like music is inside of myself, and uh, you know, I can play either in the floor or in my body or in the piano or any, you know, uh, it only takes the technique aspect of it. So after you have the technique aspect, this is just an instrument which helps you to communicate as a way of expression, you know, your idea. So that's the way I see it. So, um, you know, you can put somebody else actually playing those the same drums and they will sound completely different. Right. And uh, that's, that's just a, a fact of it. Now, what was the first kind of drumming that you studied as a kid? Well, the first kind of drumming that I studied, it was actually, uh, kind of folkloric Cuban music. So it was rumba, which inside has the guaguancó and different styles of it, and uh, street music, mm -hmm. like what we call now in an update version salsa, which in Cuba we call a song or um, Cuban music, basically. So that was, you know, my intrinsic uh, first uh, love and passion. And mm -hmm. the music from the street, from the carnivals, and, you know, they used to rehearse very close to my house, so I was the little kid which, uh, you know, kind of get lost from mom's house to, from mom's house and from mom's, you know, hand uh, just to go and see it. So every time that, that my mom heard the carnival, she know where to find me. <laughs> <laughs> now, those rhythms stay with you. I mean, those oh, yes. are very deep. Oh, yes. Uh, they have a deep history to them. Mm -hmm. Do you find that it, uh, that, that you can translate some of the, the feelings, some of the, you know, the, the, the communication that you're, you're talking about through the, through the music as opposed to the instrument. Do you find that you can make that kind of translation to Brazilian drumming, to jazz drumming, to other, other elements that come from the African diaspora? Sure, I, I see a connection in all of them. And uh, for me, it's not only about learning a pattern in itself, but try to catch the meaning of that pattern. What does that mean inside of a certain, uh, you know, structure, rhythmic structure. So for me, even though sometimes I don't have to play the whole pattern technically 
correct, but to try to capture the meaning of it. And that's, that's for me the most important because that's actually what it transcends mm -hmm. as a sound. It's not really uh, the pattern in itself. So for me, obviously, you know, we were uh, influenced by African, which is, uh, I will say, the, the roots of most of uh, percussive instruments in the world. And, and so we were influenced directly and it became part of our culture. So, uh, you know, uh, I can identify easily if I hear a, a rhythm from Brazil or any part in uh, South America or Central America, even in other places in the world as well. Mm -hmm. You can see the influence. Uh, the reason I, I asked, mentioned Brazil specifically was there was one moment in your yeah. improvisation where it seemed like maybe you mm -hmm. were going that way. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is your feeling about the, the term Latin jazz, which some people in that community like and which some people feel is kind of a box. Well, it's so uh, words are a box. You hear the words and already say something, and for people that has a, a, a belief about words, it only capture what those words mean. So it's really up to the imagination and the, rece the reception of who is listening. For me, Latin jazz is, is only a name. I mean, what other name? It could be any other name. I mean, Latin jazz, it really start, if you put it in the history of it, you know, basically somehow uh, as Cuban jazz, because mm -hmm. it was basically, you know, the... Um, Cachao. And yeah, the, yeah the, basically um, the, the kind of the relationship that had uh, Chano Pozo and Mario Bausa with Dizzy Gillespie. So that kind of uh, historical connection, which became kind of the, the strong of what it became then, it was just related to other uh, rhythms and melody and uh, cultures in Latin America, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, names, it's just a name. I mean, for me, names are just, just a name. Yeah. You know. Although you, you, you write something interesting on your website about words. You yes. know, yeah, it's just words, but words can be said in very different ways, can oh, yeah. be inflected in very different ways, and this sort of goes to the way yeah. that you approach the drums. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I, you can play one rhythm and it, it could have a completely different meaning that if you play that rhythm in just a different way. The same rhythm, but just say it with a different intention. And that's the same thing with, with words, you know. It's not the same thing to say, I love you with a very positive way or I love you with a very anger way, because it is there the intention of it. So love, it doesn't really have the same meaning, and it's love. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't really have the same meaning by the way you say it. So can these folkloric rhythms, can they mean different things in different contexts? Does, oh yeah. And, and how much does authenticity matter? I mean, is this the kind of thing that you have to be a part of the culture to be able to really? Right. Well, you know, I gave myself the right to, to develop and to evolve and to develop a lot of um, rhythms and ideas that came before me. But before that was established, something else was before. So when we point out what is tradition, I mean, tradition is what we know so far that happened before us. We don't know what happened before that tradition. And we have to understand also that uh, it, tradition is just, it's not just one day that just, this is tradition and we close this box. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a development of thing. What, whatever it came to be a tradition, it was a development from something before. You know, it wasn't like, we're gonna get this 100 years and we're gonna make the tradition. So now, what we're doing now is actually the tradition of the future. It's an extension of it. It's an extension, yeah. it's a development. It's, it's, a, it's you know, for me, I see that, uh, that I'm just actually have I, I feel I have no other choice that developing where I'm coming from, personalize that sound and, and, and move it forward to see new adventures with those rhythms, with new rhythms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what I believe it happened before. Now, is, is the, the tradition, is, is the passing down of that tradition among percussionists different than it is with singers, with violinists, pianists, you know, we, we think of those instruments as being notated. You write down what mm -hmm. you're playing, and, and that's a, a means of passing it on. Yeah, well, in, in the percussion um, uh, culture, you can say that way, um, there is a lot of oral teaching. 
It is a lot of uh, a lot of traditional um, information that ha that hasn't been written, and there is a, as I say, a character and a meaning, and the, it, it has it involved a lot of a few things. So it's very oral, as you know, you you ask probably an African percussionist, which could be the greatest percussionist, and he probably hardly can notate the music. But you put him on the stage and he probably can do an unbelievable performance where, you know, it's music. Music is not notated music or notation. That's, that's, that's something that music comes out of it, you know. So, I mean, you know, there is different qualities in people also to make something wonderful and unique. So, mm -hmm. you know. Now, when you were demonstrating the clave for us, you, you, you kept the, the basic clave yes. rhythm going and then the kind of syllabic stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. in a lot of traditions around the world, that's how drummers learn. Each syllable is oh, a different yes. drum stroke. Is that what you were doing? Well, yes. I mean, what I do basically there is what I basically do when I sit on the drums, is to let myself go and any idea that I hear at the moment, just put it right there. I mean, you definitely have to prepare your craft and everything else and kind of train your creativity as well, mm -hmm. which I believe to my consideration, <laughs> intellectually speaking, is kind of a muscle. So uh, you train it, you get ready for it, and, and every time, you know, it's not like, oh, now I'm gonna perform, I kind of freaked out, and then there is nothing I can do. There's, there's no ideas coming, because you have been working so much to get to that point, which, you know, it's nothing to worry about. It. Ideas are always gonna come. Mm -hmm. There's a, an Indian word called upaj, which describes the, the process where you learn something for like 20 years every day, like eight, 10 hours a day, and you learn the rule, and you learn the rule, and you learn the rule, and then you get out there on stage, and you just forget the rule. And it's, it, it, it literally means like free as a bird or something, uh -huh. like flying. Uh -huh. Does that sound? Well, yeah, that's something that, that's, that's one of the ways that I actually teach. I, I teach them, I, I gave them, you know, the basic rhythmic structure, and I say, well, now you have the rhythmic torture. Now what are you going to do with it? Now, how does this work in a band situation? You know, when, when you're leading a band, yes. um, you know, I mean, most of the other guys in the band are probably going to want to have some kind of idea of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So how? Well, they <laughs> are. I mean, they are. In a way, you know, I, when I compose my tunes, they, I have a very specific idea of each specific tune, what I, I'm going to do with it. And then, you know, in, in, the, in the development of the rehearsal, we can get this tune this way or this way and, you know, try different ideas. But, uh, you know, I, I normally choose musicians that are, I feel very confident and, uh, and I admire. And in a way, I know we understand each other. So, uh, you know, there's this, this very little uh, place for... Uh, for uh, or contradiction in those mm. terms, you know, like, you're not supposed to do that. It's like, <laughs> I gave myself the right already. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can take it away, you know. So how, how much of a repeatable experience, ideally, is a, a Daphnis Prieto piece? Um, it's a combination of being at the moment and repeating myself. I think if you repeat yourself, you become you, and if you're open to other things, you become more you. So it's a combination of both of them. Hmm. You should be a politician. That was a very no, please, slick no. answer. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, or I will say fortunately, I consider myself apolitical. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, as we've seen this development of interest in world music, over the past 25 years especially. Are you seeing, like, do, do the people who are listening to music from all these parts of the world, are we getting the sort of the ideas behind it? Do you see this, this sort of musical learning and sharing as important to whatever is gonna happen to us culturally in this century? I think so. I think there is great movements and great young people that are trying to, uh, you know, to represent what they are now. Because that's basically, I mean, we cannot take away where we come from, but we should represent also who we are now, because this is our time to express who we are. Uh, even if I do the best imitation of 
who somebody else was before, I wouldn't be able to do as best as he was doing it. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think there is great, and, and, and through the educational, and, and I've learned so much uh, through the, you know, educating people, uh, uh, young players and older players as well. And, you know, I've learned so much that um, I'm, I keep learning because mm -hmm. I have to kind of organize myself more in order to, you know, explain what I do, which before it was a very intuitively uh, process. You know, I just do things and, you know, I feel good, people clap and I leave. <laughs> but but now now it's kind of, you know, you sit there and they ask you, well, what are you doing here? You know, this year. And then when those things are done, then it's your part. We can do this year. And, yeah, the explanation of it. I'm actually uh, writing a book right now, which it might come out by the end of this year or beginning of the next, which, um, you know, it has a lot of self-explanatory and uh, analytical process of, you know, the learning and the teaching and also, um, you know, a lot of uh, instructional insight. But it's not just learning and teaching, it's also just listening. You yeah, know, it's, it's part Listening it's is also a, a kind of, like a muscle that, that needs to be exercised. Oh, yes, yeah. Are you listening to, I mean, do you, do you find yourself listening to things that you never would have expected that you would be listening to 10 years ago? Sure, that always happens, and it happened to me 10 years ago, too. Mm -hmm. Because um, I always try to, to really find inspiration, not only uh, you know, from classic people or people that are you know, more renowned or famous or had the possibility of getting more exposure or not, but things that are really culturally uh, that I really want to, you know, get that sense and that meaningful uh, expression in me, and uh, you know, there's there's so much, so much um, to to learn and to hear. And, and there's so much out there, and it's all accessible. Whether you're talking about, you know, the yeah, I mean, sometimes you play in something like in the middle of the solo, you say. Where did I hear this before? Where did that or something come from? <laughs> similar. It's, it sounds familiar, but I don't know if it's like 10 or 20 years ago. Uh -huh. You know. So, but you know, the most important thing for me is to really be at the moment playing and give that moment a special meaning and and put you know myself up there every time that I sit on the drums or every time that I write music or do anything. Well, Daphne, obviously, uh, people have been responding to the message hearing not just the technique, but the thought behind it. Congratulations on the MacArthur Fellowship, and thank you very much. Thank you, John. My pleasure. Thank you. That was really very inspiring and, and uh, gives us a lot to think about. Uh, my name is John Gilbert and I'm the uh, Director of Music Education and it is my real honor to speak about Francisco Nunez who has received this Mac, uh, the MacArthur Fellow. Um, he's been here, he graduated from NYU Music Ed in 1988, and uh, I remember that time very vividly. My son was eight years old, and he sang in the first chorus that I know of that Nunez actually uh, put together and directed, which was the Children's Aid Society. And uh, that was made a real impression on my son. Um, he's always continued to be in music, even though now he's driving an ambulance for the New York Fire Department and has given his life over to helping others, but he said, Dad, music will always be a part of my life. And I think Francisco had a lot to do with getting him started in the right direction. It was really exciting. I went to performances. I took him to the chorus rehearsals, picked him up, was a typical chorus dad. You know, so uh, it was really exciting to, to see that aspect uh, Francisco, but I knew from the time that I saw Francisco that he, he had a vision and an energy that was different. And I want to uh, just 
call to your attention two people who are in the audience tonight. Elaine Gates, who was his advisor in music education when he graduated, and Henry Gates. If you would just stand up and let, let uh, people know you're there. Very exciting to have them here. And Elaine uh, was such a, an important part of the formative years of our music education program. So it's been extremely exciting. Uh, Francisco is described as a composer, a conductor, a visionary, uh, and he is all of that. Uh, and he uh, has brought to the world a kind of new vision, I think, of how music can work in young people's life, particularly in choral music and in the, the way in which uh, young lives are brought together into collaboration. He's actually changed the paradigm for music for young people in that he has commissioned works from all over the world. He has composed works, he's arranged works, and he has such a charisma when he's conducting that when he was here, he was directing the university singers for eight years, and uh, everybody wanted to be in his chorus, and whenever he was performing on this stage, there was such an electricity in the performance. I mean, it just was magnetic and, and uh, inspiring. So that to have us use this uh, same space now to honor Francisco in, in this achievement, which I think is a recognition of a vision that will continue uh, to expand and grow. Uh, he's working uh, in the Dominican Republic with a new initiative in choral music that I think it can set a paradigm for international uh, cooperation and collaboration in uh, using vocal music and choral music as a way of uh, changing the lives of young people and creating a vision of what they can become. Uh, so it's an extremely exciting thing. And I would like to invite uh, Francisco to come up We have this, this uh, plaque that honors his uh, award, and we want to say we take pride in recognizing faculty member, music education alumnus, and 2011 MacArthur Fellow re recipient Francisco Nunez for his outstanding contributions to the NYU music community. And that contribution continues right now. Whatever he does is resonating with all of us, and we really are so proud to have you Thank here. You. Thank you. And we're going to have a chance to hear him with his uh, youth chorus because they're waiting backstage to come on. All right. So thank you thank again. Thank you, John. A real pleasure. Thank I'll hold on to thank this. You. Thank you. Thank you, John. I chose a piece because Daphnis and I worked together two years ago. He brought COC Quartet over the Jazz Lincoln Center, and he shared his gifts with the, the YPC audience, and he dazzled everyone. So I said, why don't we do a piece for Clavin Children's Choir? So this is a near honor in many ways, as all thought Daphne's. So this is a piece by Paquito de Rivera. Paquito is a Cuban-born uh, musician, clarinetist, and uh, he wrote his very first choral piece uh, for Children's Choir, and he based it on a woman named Tembandumba, and he uses a lot of similarities what you did. And you're going to hear the children speaking in many different ways, like a rhythm thing. The words are by Luis, um, uh, by, uh, who is it? Pucho Escalante and Luis Pales Matos, who are two Puerto Ricans. They work with, uh, with a Cuban uh, com a composer and a Dominican American uh, conductor. So it's a real Caribbean feel in this piece. It's called Temban Dumba, and it's here's the Young People's Chorus in New York City. We have about 26 singers with us tonight.
Nicely done, Francisco. Well, they did it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you had a hand in there, a voice in there, too. Interesting um, to have that piece on the same program as Daphnis and you know, giving us the drum kit as melodic instrument. We think of the voice as a melodic instrument, the chorus as a harmonic instrument. Here's a piece that plays on the voice as a rhythmic That's exactly instrument. Right. And when Paquito brought it on, he wanted the feeling of the and he wanted that feeling in the words. So when he put that, that idea together, they were able to really work with it. It was a little challenging at first because memorizing all those words is challenging, but each one is a rhythm, and the kids love it. And then also to bring in the rap kind of idea, which is uh, what vocal percussion with words or so. So the idea of a piece that really falls all along the spectrum of speech and song. You know, the, there's, there are parts that are clearly sung, parts that seem like they're spoken, parts that are like rap somewhere in between. Right. And that's a really, you know, that, that would be a remarkable piece for a grown-up choir. Uh, here you are doing it with, you know, younger singers. Um, a text that I happen to know some parents might think twice about having their teenage daughters singing, but it's, it's, it's Tin Bandumba, she's kind of a sassy sort. She's got rhythm. See, in the Latin culture, uh, young men and women, they uh, are more comfortable expressing themselves, um, I feel, than we have here. Um, so it is more natural to speak and talk with this word. There's nothing bad being said, it's all the sassiness, as you said, yeah. which isn't you, and, and, and it gets it, but the kids get into it, they love it, and we keep it as innocent as possible, of course. <laughs> now, how did you, I mean, as a child, did you sing? Were, was there choruses where you grew up? Um, well, my very f first experience was with my mother. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up here in New York City, um, what's called now the Upper West Side. <laughs> it's a little different back then. And um, she was my first piano teacher, and she's still here with me right now. My mom is right there, Ismaela. Hola. <laughs> uh, so she wanted to have music in our household. Um, music has always been important to us as a Dominican family household where we all, I remember in the summers in the Dominican Republic with my grandfather in the bandillon, mm -hmm. he's playing, and everybody's singing, the guitar's coming off my uncles, and we're dancing. Music was always a part of everything we did. The concept of playing an instrument that's classical, that's more of a, um, I don't know what the right word is, it brings you to a different class of people. It's an aspirational thing. It's an thing, aspirational yeah. thing. So to have, for example, a piano in the Dominican Republic with all the humidity and the hurricanes, is you know, quite challenging. We lived on the third floor, so it worked. Um, and uh, when I came, when, you know, I was born here, of course, in New York City, and I grew up there and here. So the music kept going back. I had the classical training and the Latino training, so it brought it all, all together. And music was a way for me to find other people that also believed in making great art. So when I was a kid, my mom would take me to these concerts or these recitals, and I would meet these other great kids playing Mozart and Chopin beautifully. So I wanted to, be, I wanted to meet them, and I wanted to play forehand music with them. So I'd have to practice really hard. Um, the other kids in the street were playing stickball downstairs, and I was, I was known as the pianist on my block. That experience really taught me to understand other cultures. So I came out of the concept of just staying with the Latinos, and opening up to other kinds of people. All of us want the same thing, great art and great education. So money had nothing to do with it. Uh, at that point, I wanted to study music, and I studied with my mom. And when I graduated from NYU, Elaine was there, forced me to take music education courses. I was a piano major, and I wanted to just play piano. Um, and I went and studied at Third Street Music School, and I saw this guy, Jerry Curlin, teaching. I said, there's no way I'm teaching children. This is, no, this is ridiculous, who wants to do that? Um, but she said, give it a couple of weeks, and it's true. I fell in love with the whole concept of what kids can freaking do. They're awesome. So why, how did you get from piano, you know, uh, why not just go and teach kids to play the piano? What gave you the idea that, that a chorus would be the right modus operandi for you? I actually started a piano studio when I was 14. So I started teaching the piano thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
when I went and saw what the choir did is that it gave children that could not get a piano. And one of the problems that I had is they didn't have pianos, and the electric piano, the Casio, wasn't available just yet back then. Right. You know, so we had to actually have a piano. So how do I get to children? How do I introduce this to them? So I used voice as a means, thinking that I'll get to the piano eventually. Ah. And I, stick, I stuck with it. Okay. And at some point, probably some point fairly early in the game, you had to make a decision about repertoire. Yes. Because at least in this country, there isn't much of a repertoire for children's choir. I mean, there's a sort of a long tradition uh, across the Atlantic in England, which you've added to with some of your commissions. But um, what was that process like of, of d determining how you were going to create a body of work for these kids to sing? I started listening to other choirs here in America and abroad through back then tapes. And um, I loved what they were singing. And the composers that kept coming back were Benjamin Britten and Zoltan Koda and Bella Bartok. You know, that was it when it came to children's choir. Vivaldi did a couple of things for girls, choirs from the old days. But after a couple of years, that repertoire was done. So I started to look into commissioning works or finding works by people in the college profession working um, with, with music. But my audience didn't know these people. They didn't know who these people were. So I asked somebody, I remember early on, says, why do you go to Carnegie Hall? You're not a musician. Why do you go? He goes, well, I like the feeling when I'm there, and I like hearing Mozart. So she knew the name Mozart. What was the piece you liked? She could not tell me. Hmm. So that said to me, okay, so people like name recognition. Who has name recognition in the children's choir world? And I noticed that no one winning the Pulitzers, the Oscars, uh, the Grammys, the MacArthur's, were writing for children's choirs. And I asked them, why don't you write for it? Today the answer is, no one asked. But I found out earlier, it's just they didn't want to. Mm -hmm. It was the stigma of being with children. Um, when in 2001, uh, I went to the 92nd Street Y and I said, I would like to create a music program to get the greatest composers of our day to write for children and sing it on the stage. They said, no way. Um, I kept asking. <laughs> Frederick Noonan was there. Michael Barrett was there. And I said, they finally called me back and said, well, Ned Roram has one concert left in this series. This is his last concert in all the series. He's willing to end it with you. Fine. At that point, I remember calling Linda Golding from Boozy and Hawks, John Schaefer from WNYC to come over and discuss this whole thing. So you've been there since the beginning, John. And, and I have to say, Francisco, the thing that has impressed and frankly puzzled me all the way through is that nobody seems to say no to you. <laughs> uh, Robert mentioned before how the the whole process of nominating and, and sort of writing letters of recommendation for people for the MacArthur's is, is, is very secretive and very confidential. I have to confess that in my letter to the MacArthur's about you, uh, knowing that they were going to get tons of very earnest, you know, uh, let, me, let me give them something a little different. And I said something along the lines of, Francisco Nunez must have some kind of secret mental powers because he is able to get people who have no intention or inclination or desire to spend lots of time with lots of children to do exactly <laughs> that. I have two kids of my own. I didn't need to be in a meeting with you and then year after year hosting these trans and yet somehow it's like I find yes coming out of my mouth whenever you ask. And I'm so excited about it. So thank you for but, all but, these but years. But how does this happen? <laughs> I mean... Uh, John Corigliano, Ned Roram, uh, some of the leading uh, British composers of our time. Michael you, Nyman. Mike, uh, Michael Nyman and... Uh, Jeffrey Bergen. Uh, 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 Michael Gordon Michael. And, and Michael Torkey and just, you know, the list of, like, really fine composers who've written... For, it's, it's, it's really incredible. What, what, what is the pitch? How are you getting all these people to say yes? <laughs> um... I don't know. <laughs> um, I just ask. And what the funny thing is, I think they trust that it's going to be great. And what I find funny is that they write masterpieces. I perform these pieces over and over again. I have not yet found a piece I won't perform again. 
You know, Paquita wrote this piece two years ago. I'm mm -hmm. still performing it. Um, we have a, a symposium happening next week um, with Carnegie Hall. Well, I heard about that. <laughs> and um, and it's, it's, it's exciting because we're bringing, now what's happening with the music is it's too hard. This is too hard for children to sit. Um, and you, we can't get other choirs around the country to sing it yet. So I did get audiences to come that are interested in hearing the music. Forget that they're kids. You know, forget the parents coming. They're coming to hear music of this composer and they respect the music. The composer shows a respect for it as well. You help by explaining the music to people. But how do I get another choir in a different state to sing this? That's the next level. You know, Meredith Monk said to me, it's, it's easy for me, I'm sure Daphne has the same situation, he was talking about it on stage, it's easy, it's easy for me to do it, but the idea of transferring my information onto someone else is the hardest thing I'm going through right now. And well, it's interesting you mentioned Meredith Monk, because she is part of a generation of composers who, when she started in the 60s, it was assumed that her music was sui generis. It was just for her to sing. And then over the years, she found a small group of singers, the Meredith Monk Vocal Ensemble, who she could sort of pass that on to. Now, there are choirs singing her works, and, and string or, a string orchestras doing arrangements of her vocal pieces for string orchestra, and the YPC performing at least one of her pieces, Three Heavens and Hells. So we're seeing a kind of performance practice unfold. Uh, uh, Daphnis was talking about tradition, you know, there's this tradition is not what happens in 100 years. If there's stuff before, there's stuff. We're, we're seeing that, that kind of living, breathing tradition happen with YPC. And Steve Reich, I remember he was at the Bang on a Can also. I know Julia Wolf is here. It's a Bang on a, Ga Bang on a Can marathon, listening to his piece, and he's talking, and there is David Lang and Julia and Michael Gordon, and he's saying, it's so funny. Back then, no one can do my music without me. Now I walk to concert halls and people are doing it. Yeah. So children, young people, it's that generation that's taken on from the performance practice, giving it to young people. I mean, they're going to keep it much longer, in my opinion. It's going to be ingrained in them. But what's important to me, it's not just a concept of great art, that you see who was singing. We in New York take it for granted that these kids come together just like this and sing from all these backgrounds. Unfortunately, around the country, it's not that simple. When we travel around the world, we're one of the only choirs singing at the same level as Estonia and Sweden and South Africa, but with a mixed group of kids. And what the, the concept of the YPC is beyond just the art. Art has always been my default. I cannot expect to be less than great with these kids. They need me to do that. They need every musician that we work with to do that. The composers do that. But when you use that level and you bring everybody up to it, that's when everybody starts to change. And inside, those kids start to make very different choices from I'm not going to college to I'm going to college. And that seems very simple. But here at NYU, that's very important. I have one of my students here who sings in my young men's division taking photography, and he says, nine days from today, I find out if Tish takes me on into this college. So, I mean, he was not going to go to college, and he's the first to admit he was going to get a job. And now he's doing it, because the kids around him are pushing him. You have talent, go for it. So I believe that society needs music to do more than just muse. Mm -hmm. It needs to create a way of forming new societies, and then those societies will then make a difference. In the Dominican Republic, we're starting a new initiative where we're going into five neighborhoods this has not been done before. Three very poor neighborhoods and two rich neighborhoods. And we're going to combine them separately, and then once a week on Saturdays, bring them together. This is unusual because there's a class warfare down there. We're going to hopefully create the Young People's Course of San Domingo. Now there's talk, amongst myself, to go to Haiti <laughs> and do the same thing in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And the big divide between the Dominican Republic and Haiti is fierce. Right. But if we share could, the same island, of share course. Share the same island, that's all. Yeah. There's not, there, we have very little in common right now, especially after the earthquake, there's been a lot of diversity um, issues with um, letting people into the country. If we can bring the children together in the summer using music and with the f 
art form of, of song, which they all have, and it's ingrained in them. We can bring them together through music and bring it at the highest level, and then bring them here to New York and sing. People can see that a change can happen just simply with the power of song. Do you take any um, inspiration from El Sistema, the Venezuelan system, which you know brings chorus and orchestral playing to, you know, to the barrios, to the poorest kids, and and it's it's kind of a, it, it's a tool to get kids in school, staying in school, and you know whether they become musicians or not. I mean, as you know, the kind of communal aspect of making music, especially in a chorus. How valuable is that? I mean, do, do, do you take something from that example? Well, Professor Abru has created an incredible program in Venezuela that is now reaching uh, so many other countries, and uh, here in America as well, it's taking over. I think what he's done is one of the most powerful things. Um, and I do take, I, I, I admire, and I listen, and I watch, and I talk with people from El Sistema, and we're trying to collaborate. There's a, now, there's a, 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 a nuclea Nuclear here in New York City, mm -hmm. and, um, and another I think it's in LA, another right? In with LA. Gustavo Dudamel. Exactly. Well, Gustavo is a, a whole different animal, you know. So um, he's doing amazing things. So, but there are so many children. There are one million children in New York City in the public school system. Um, we have room for many more programs, not just YPC, but everyone their own way. And I think. The music school here at NYU has taught me the importance of what music can do, not only artistically, but socially. And I'm hoping to leave that. And I think all of us here, there's so many music ed people out there, I think it's important. We all want to teach for a reason. We want to change a life. And that's, that's incredible to me. So if, if you had the chance to go back and follow the piano track to where you could now be playing piano quartets and you know piano quintets, is that the... Would, do you think you get the same kind of jolt that you get from traveling <laughs> the world with a pile of teenagers? <laughs> um, I, work with, I work with professionals all the time, and they're incredible, um, but they're very demanding, and they won't work as hard as some of these kids will, uh, I think. And um, I, will, I still play, mm -hmm. I practice, and I love it, and I... If I listen to music in the morning, it's using Mozart, and I'm listening to piano concertos. I'm studying Greek piano concerto right now. Uh, I, I will always play, but my passion right now is working with, a, uh, with, with these young people specifically and helping them reach a level of artistry and then teaching others to do something similar to that. That, to me, is where I am and I find most important. Now, it, we're, we're using the the name YPC is if it's a single entity. It's never been a single entity, or at least not for almost as long as I've known you. Uh, what are the, I mean, what is the structure of the organization? What's the, uh, you know, what, what's the, the kind of the, the purpose of each of the, the different subsets of YPC? Well, the Young People's Chorus of New York City um, is 1,200 children in New York City. We have 900 in the public school system where we go into 10 different public schools. We have, I think, 13 choirs in there, very large choirs, um, from elementary school to high school, and we are the music education program in those schools. Unless they have a music teacher, then we work with the music teacher. Um, beyond that, this group you saw here is part of what we call the Contra Chorus Division, um, which is just our older kids. Uh, we have 350 young people divided by age, but they all perform. We do not divide them by level. Uh, we could have easily had any other group singing tonight. Uh, you, next week when, you, when you're with us, you can hear our Cantari division singing pieces by Doug Cuomo and Derek Bumel. Our young men also singing pieces by Michael Gordon and David O'Tredigy. So they, they, what's unique is that it's boys and girls and the kids go from middle school up through high school in the same and they have a, a mentoring system where they help each other figure it out. One of the kids was late to rehearsal tonight because there's a, an accident on the sixth train. So before they got out here, they're teaching them all the moves that we just added tonight to Tembandumba. So there's a real mentoring in that way. Mm -hmm. When you go to a composer, do you say, I mean, do, do you specifically say to them, don't write down because it's kids, just write what you need to write and we will find the kids who can do it? Well, Julia Wolf, are you still here? There she is. Well, she's commissioned to write a piece for us 
this coming uh, year for our Radio Radiance program, which has a little bit to do with you as well, John. And um, we talked, and all I gave her was ranges, I think, of what the kids can do. I think we need to, I mean, I don't, when I first started, um, I, maybe I said that, I don't remember, but maybe I did say that. I said, I, what I said to them is, I've heard your other music. Can you find the equivalent of your chamber music for the voice? One thing that most of these composers all had in common is that they never wrote for the voice, or they definitely never wrote for children's choir. So they didn't know how. So they didn't know what hard or easy was. Mm. Believe me, it's all hard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you've created a, a new repertoire where previously there was very, very little. And th there is also this, this communal aspect. I mean, we see people coming together, amateur choirs. There's a, um, there's a sacred harp sing, you know, a shape note sing that happens like every week for many, many years. People who didn't grow up in the South with, you know, Southern Harmony or any of those books, but love the communal feeling of just singing with, with their friends and neighbors. Uh, is there a way to kind of take what you give these kids in YPC? Is there a way for them to take that out of YPC and to continue to have that, that kind of rich communal experience? Uh, Pete Seeger wanted everyone to sing. That's his goal in life. Uh, singing we can all do. Bad or good, that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you join an organization like this, uh, we, I, am not looking to create musicians. I'm looking to create, create better humans so we can treat each other better. So that you, that I, a Latino America, American, can be sitting here with you. John Schaefer. Whatever I am. Uh, exactly. And, um, I'm and a radio American. American <laughs> exactly. Th that's a big deal. Um, and I think that um, oh, what, if they can take that with them. I have a kid uh, at Yale right now. She's studying at Yale. And um, she's an artist. And she joined an you know, she's a, a, a French-American girl. And she joined an a cappella group called Shade. She's the only white girl in the whole group. And I said, why, why did you go to that group? She goes, I just wanted to. I felt comfortable with that music. Um, I'm not saying that that's what I'm, I'm asking anyone to do. But the concept that these young people are going to be comfortable in any kind of society and feel like it's n natural, that to me is what song is doing for these kids. Mm -hmm. um, many are becoming musicians. We have uh, uh, a couple of popular ones. Elizabeth Zeman is mm -hmm. doing quite well. Elizabeth uh, and the Catapult, her uh, indie rock band. Indie rock band. We have Yoko Kokuchi who's doing quite well. We have a couple of classical singers who are getting, you know, masters and are singing around the world as understudies now. But they're just growing up. So musically speaking, these young people are becoming important in our musical world. Uh, and I think that's great. Yeah. Although, as you say, the, the even more important thing is what they're, what they're getting out of it, whether they become musicians or not, and that, that sense of, of community and of accomplishment, of aspiration, of aspiration fulfilled, right. has got to be one of the things that keeps parents sending their kids to you year after year, Francisco. Congratulations. <laughs> <And you too. laughs> Congratulations. Thanks.